Lycurgus, the lawgiver, wishing to recall the citizens from the mode of living then existent and to lead them to a more sober and temperate order of life and to render them good and honorable for they were living a soft life, reared two puppies of the same litter. One he accustomed to dainty food and allowed to stay in the house. The other he took afield and trained in hunting. Later, he brought them into the public assembly and put down some bones and dainty food and let loose a hare. Each of the dogs made for that which it was accustomed. And when the one of them had overpowered the hare, he said, you see, fellow citizens, that these dogs belong to the same stock, but by the virtue of discipline to which they have been subjected, they have turned out utterly different from each other. And you also see that the training is more effective than nature for good. So also in our case, fellow citizens, noble birth, so admired of the multitude, and our being descended from Hercules, does not bestow any advantage, unless we do the sort of things for which he was manifestly the most glorious and most noble of all mankind. And unless we practice and learn what is good our whole life long, He made a redistribution of the land and assigned an equal share to all citizens. And it is said that a while later, on returning from abroad, as he passed through the country where the harvesting had just been finished, and he saw the stalks of grain standing near together in even lines, he was much pleased and said with a smile to those who were with him, it looks as if all the Spartan land belongs to many brothers who have recently divided it. Having introduced the abolition of debts, he next undertook to divide equally all household furnishings, so as to do away completely with all inequality and disparity. He decreed that gold and silver coin should in the future have no value, and ordained that people should use iron money only. When this had been done, all wrongdoing was banished from Sparta, for nobody was able to steal or accept a bribe or defraud or rob any more. When the result was something of which concealment was not possible, nor was its acquisition envied, nor its use without risk. As an added measure, he brought about the banishment from Sparta of everything not absolutely necessary. And by reason of this, no merchant, no public lecturer, no soothsayer, no priest, maker of fancy articles, ever made his way into Sparta. Having determined to make an attack upon the prevailing luxury and to do away with the rivalry for riches, he instituted the common meals and in answer to those who sought to know why he'd established these and had divided the citizens when under arms to small companies, he said, so that they may get their orders promptly, and in case they cherish any radical designs, the offense may be confined to a small number. Also that there may be for all an equal portion of food and drink, and so that not only in drink or food, but in bedding or furniture, or anything else whatsoever. The rich man may have no advantage at all over the poor man. Having made wealth unenviable, since nobody could make any use or show of it, he said to his intimate friends, what a good thing it is, my friends, to show in actual practice the true characteristics of wealth, that it is blind. The well-to-do citizens resented legislation of this type, and banding together, they denounced him and pelted him, wishing to stone him to death. As he was being pursued, he rushed through the marketplace 
and he outdistanced almost all his pursuers and gained refuge in the shrine of Athena. As he turned around, Alcander, who was pursuing him, put out one of his eyes by a stroke of his staff. But later, when Lycurgus received Alcander, who was handed over to him for punishment by the vote of the people, he did not treat him ill nor blame him, but by compelling him to live under the same roof with him, he brought it to pass that Alcander had only commendation for Lycurgus and for the manner of living which he had found there, and was altogether enamored of this discipline. Being asked why he had not made use of any written laws, he said, because those who are trained and disciplined in the proper discipline can determine what will best serve the occasion. At another time, when some sought to know why he had ordained that people should use only an axe in putting up a roof on their houses and make a door with a saw only and none of the other tools, he said, so that the citizens may be moderate in regard to all the things which they bring into the house, may possess none of the things which are the cause of rivalry among other peoples. Being asked, why he had prohibited frequent campaigns against the same foes, he said, so that they may not, by becoming accustomed to defending themselves frequently, become skilled in war. When someone else desired to know why he instituted strenuous exercise for the bodies of the maidens in races and wrestling and throwing the discus and javelin, he said, so that the implanted stock of their offspring, by getting a strong start in strong bodies, may attain a noble growth, and that they themselves may with vigor abide the birth of their children, and readily and nobly resist the pains of travail. And moreover, if they need arise, that they may be able to fight for themselves, their children, and their country. When some persons expressed disapproval of the nudity of the maidens in the processions and sought to know the reason for it, he said, so that they, by following the same practices as the men, may not be inferior to them either in bodily strength and health or in mental aspirations and qualities, and that they may despise the opinions of the crowd. Wherefore is recorded the wife of Leonidas a saying as to this effect, when some woman, a foreigner presumably, remarked to her, You Spartan women are the only women that lord it over your men. She replied, Yes, for we are the only women that are the mothers of men. By excluding the unmarried from looking on at the festival of the naked youth, and by laying upon them other additional disgrace, he created much concern about having children. When someone inquired why he had made a law that the girl should be given in marriage without any dowry, he said, so that some of them shall not be left unwed because of lack of means, and some shall not be eagerly sought out because of abundance of wealth, but that each man, with an eye to the ways of the maid, shall make virtue the basis of his choice. For this reason, he also banished from the state all artificial enhancement of beauty. He set limits to the time of marriage for both men and women, and in answer to the man who inquired about this, he said, so that the offspring may be sturdy by being sprung from mature parents. In answer to a man who expressed surprise because he was barred from spending the night with his wife, he ordained that he should be with his comrades most of the day and pass the whole night in their company and visit his bride secretly and with great circumspection so that they may be strong of body and never become sated and that they may be ever fresh in affection and that the children which they bring into the world 
may be more sturdy. He banished perfume on the ground, that it spoiled and ruined the olive oil. To all those whose business was the enhancement of personal beauty, he made Sparta forbidden ground, for the reason that they outraged the arts through the vileness of their art. So strict in those times was the virtue of the women, and so far removed from the laxity of morals which later affected them, that in the earlier days, the idea of adultery among them was an incredible thing. There is never an adulterer in our country. How could there ever be an adulterer in Sparta, in which wealth and luxury and advantageous aids to beauty are held in disesteem, and respect and good order and obedience to authority are given the highest place? In answer to the man who was insistent that he establish a democracy in the state, Lycurgus said, Do you first establish a democracy in your own house? When someone inquired why he had ordained such small and inexpensive sacrifices to the gods, he said, So that we may honor the divine powers without ceasing. As he permitted the citizens to engage only in that kind of athletic contest in which no one can give up, somebody inquired what was the reason. He replied, so that not one of the citizens shall get the habit of crying quits in the midst of a hard struggle. When asked why he ordered a frequent change of camping place, he said, so that we may inflict greater injury upon our enemies. When asked why he forbade assaults on walled places, he said, so that valiant men may not suffer death at the hands of a woman or a child or some such person. In answer to some of the citizens who desired to know, how can we keep off an invasion by enemies? He said, if you remain poor and none of you desires to be more important than another. And at another time, when they raised a question about fortifications, he said that a city is not unfortified whose crowning glory is men and not bricks and stones. The Spartans gave particular attention to their hair, recalling a saying of Lycurgus in reference to it that it made the handsome more comely and the ugly more frightful. He gave instructions that in war, when they had put the enemy to flight and had gained a victory, that they should continue the pursuit only far enough to make their success assured and then return immediately. For he said that it was neither a noble trait nor a Greek trait to slay those who had yielded. And this policy was not only honorable and magnanimous, but useful as well. For the opposing army, knowing that they customarily spared those who surrendered, but made away with those who resisted, would regard it as more profitable to flee than to stay. When someone inquired why he forbade spoiling the enemy's dead, he said, so that the soldiers may not, by looking about covertly for spoil, neglect their fighting, but also that they may keep to their poverty as well as to their post. I will not bring dishonor on my sacred arms, nor will I abandon my comrade wherever I shall be stationed. I will defend the rights of gods and men and will not leave my country smaller when I die, but greater and better. So far as I am able by myself and with the help of all, I will respect the rulers of the time duly and the existing ordinances duly and all others 
which may be established in the future. And if anyone seeks to destroy the ordinances, I will oppose him so far as I am able, by myself, with the help of all. I will honor the cults of my fathers. Witnesses to this shall be the gods. Ares, Athena the warrior, Zeus, Hercules, and the boundaries of my native land. <laughs>